It's Podcast Radio. I'm Graham Mack and a couple of special guests here. I don't want to get uh, ripped off um, YouTube by playing the James Bond music, but we should really be playing the James Bond music right now, but I'm sure there'll be a copyright strike against me if I do that on YouTube. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're a bit funny about that. They yeah. are a little bit funny about that. <laughs> so uh, I present the pod. 20, which goes out every Friday, 5 o'clock on Podcast Radio. It's a countdown, a chart show about who's on the charts, the top-selling podcasts in the world. And one of those podcasts is James Bond A to Z. So welcome to the program, Tom Wheatley and Brendan Duffy. How are you? Hello. Really good, thank you. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks for having us. So so now people understand why I'm dressed the way I am, because I thought I'd make the, the effort for James Bond. I was just showing the guys. I don't know if I can... I don't know if I can show. I found some, I found some cufflinks that are Union Jacks. Can you see that there? I don't know if you can. I hope you can see it. I thought that's if James Bond had cufflinks, they're the ones he'd have. Uh, that's or a martini glass, one of those. I was looking for. I don't have a martini glass, but I was going to do that. And of course, I don't have a gun. Uh, you know what I'm saying? No. <laughs> so, so there's three of you usually present the podcast. Tom yeah. Butler, as well as Tom Wheatley and Brendan Duffy. So where's Tom today? What's the deal with him? He's a part timer, isn't he? He's, yeah, he's, 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 he doesn't put the effort in. Yeah. He's probably watching this now. He's probably about to message me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what's your background? Let's start with you, Tom. So I'm, um, I've got a bit of a mixed bag. I'm a journalist at the moment. Um, I've been a journalist in the past. I'm a bit of a fitness journalist now, um, but I've always been a massive film fan, uh, as 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 you can probably guess, a Bond fan as well. Um, I actually used to go to school with Tom Butler. Um, who isn't here? Uh, and we, well, we spent a lot of time in class talking about Bond. And it wasn't until now that we eventually said, I think lockdown started it, where he said, um, "Oh, let's, we've got a bit of time now. Why don't we do something with this obsession with Bond that we've got?" And um, the, the podcast was born. Wow. And Brendan, um, I'm a, I'm actually a civil servant and an improviser as well. So, um, yeah. Does improvisation it- help in the civil service? Absolutely not. <laughs> Useless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I I went to university with Tom Butler. And so that's how we met. And we studied film. Yeah. Um, film broadcast production. And then that's how I met Tom Wheatley, because mm-hmm. obviously he's a friend of Tom. So um, and I'll say, yeah, before this, the last time we met is probably about a decade ago, like in, in real life, in person. Yeah, yeah. Right, so it was so really lock, just... lockdown spurred this on, you know, we've reacquainted ourselves with each other and, uh, yeah, not look back. Over your love of James Bond films. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me how each of you first got involved in James Bond and uh, why James Bond films spoke to you. First film you went to see, that kind of thing. What's the deal? Brenda, do you want to go first? Oh, well, it's just me going to be talking about Pierce Brosnan for the next 20 oh, minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm unsure whether the first one I saw at the cinema is either Tomorrow Never Dies or The World Is Not Enough. Now, yeah. they came out quite close together, but I know it was Pierce Brosnan. And Pierce Brosnan fueled my um, obsession with Bond because I think he's the, the perfect Bond. Um, and yeah, moving forward, I've always just kept up. And then you go back and you look back at the old ones and... Yeah, it just grows and grows. And I mean, the 60s ones are classics, aren't they? So, you know, you just get enraptured by the, the whole Bond world. And Tom? Yeah, I, um, I've i always had a bit of an obsession with old films since I was... I think I watched old films from when I was about 12 years old. It's my, my dad's fault. He doesn't like new films, basically. So I was forced to watch old films as a kid. But um, yeah, I think... Um, ever since I started watching the old Sean Connery ones when I was really young that I don't know, I've never, I've never classed myself as being really into Bond. I've just always, you know, just always enjoyed them. And it wasn't until we talked about doing a podcast that I realized I am quite into Bond and I'm a bit obsessed with it. Um, But for me, it's, it's always been just, it's just, part of a big series of films that I really like. Um, And it's always, because there's so many of them, it's a big, it's quite a big part of that. Um, but yeah, uh, I've, I've probably, I think the first one I can remember seeing at the cinema, which is probably the same for most people around my age is, is golden eye. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but for me, I think Brendan, Brendan's a little bit obsessed with Piers Brosnan. So a lot of his <laughs> early memories come from, from the Brosnan films. But for me, I, I think I saw golden eye and I, I thought it was all right. I wasn't that bothered, but I 
I probably spent most of my weekends watching Bond films before that. So for me, it wasn't a big thing in the Bond um, story in the Bond series. But um, but yeah, I've just um, it's just always been quite a big part of you know every conversation I seem to have in the pub. So Brendan, what is the best Pierce Brosnan Bond film then? It's Goldeneye. Yeah, the first one, nineteen ninety five. Yeah, in my opinion, it's that's the that's the best one. That's the one where he's in the tank, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I like Tomorrow Never Dies as as a as a Pierce Brosnan film. But my you're making me feel really old because the first James Bond film I saw was when it came out at the cinema was Live and Let Die was 1973. Wow. Roger Moore's first outing yeah. as James Bond. And I thought it was brilliant. And, oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, um when I, I, mean, I don't know what was, was it? I was probably was I nine somewhere? but then when I was about 14 at our our school fair they had like loads of paperback books and they had the paperback of live and let die it was probably a first edition as well I don't know but anyway I bought it for about 10p and I found the book it sounds like really snobby doesn't it but I found the book even more enjoyable than the film and one of the thing I and then and then I read after that, I'd read, I think it was Goldfinger, and I read From Russia With Love. And then I read a Robert Markham one called Colonel Son. Kingsley Amos mm-hmm. called himself Robert Markham for a bit and wrote, wrote Fleming's Bond slightly differently. And so I got, they were the first real books I ever, you know, apart from books you have to read at school, that I chose to read were the yeah. James Bond books. And about two years ago, I decided to revisit them, and I read every one of the Fleming Bond books in the order they were published, starting with Casino Royale. And after that, I really I really got the feeling, and I don't know if you'll agree, that I bet, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If only the films could have set the Bond in the Cold War of the 50s where the books are set all the way through... They wouldn't, because some of those Roger Moore ones in the 70s there get a bit dated now. Um, Moonraker, oh, yeah, I yeah. think, is rubbish. And I think it's a lot <laughs> of it is because, well, you know, with that thing with Jaws and the girl with the pigtails and all that, you know, that wasn't, for me, it wasn't James Bond, you know. But I think yeah, Live and Let yeah. Die was brilliant. I st- that's In fact, Live and Let Die is probably one of my favourite James Bond films, but probably because I saw it first. Do you think maybe they missed a, they missed a trick that they couldn't have seen coming? That maybe if they'd said... Because in the books, you know, you'll see like the beginning of Live and Let Die, die, die and it says, you know, that the Boeing Strato Cruiser touched down at Idlewild Airport, you know, because it was before it was called JFK and it was before we had, yeah. so, you know, J- Boeing jets and everything. And that there's a real romance, an extra... It's almost like an extra character in the books now because the books are locked in that time. Do you think maybe the movies could have slipped up? Oh yeah, we've definitely. talked about this. Have you? Um, and we, yeah, because we've talked about moving forward. We'd like them to make a period piece, and right. you know, in terms of making them on film, the sixties is where you know Bond seems timeless. It's sort of a little capsule. Yeah. So those early, the first three, especially Doctor No, From Russia with Love, and, and uh, Goldfinger. Goldfinger. Yeah. They're just it just set perfectly. Everything just feels right and. We we dream of uh, them making one set in in the in the early sixties. Yeah, yeah, so very much similar. We've had those conversations. Yeah, so yeah. there's how... a certain style about Bond, and, and you lose it when you get into the more technical ones. And um, you look at obviously things like the Pierce Brosnan era with Die Another Day and to a, like Tomorrow Never Dies. They have a, there's a lot of technology in there. Um, Which was the, the one early... with the invisible car? That was just that's, silly. That's die another day, yeah. And is that the one with the surfing in it? Is it just yeah, yeah. Oh, terrible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you you get this kind of thing where in the early Bonds, he he was very much a uh, in the in the books, he was very much a it, it was him using his skills and resourcefulness to solve things, and then later on, he just he just has a watch that does it. So <laughs> it's all it's all done for yeah. him. Um, yeah. But that's and and also there's, I always find a problem with the modern ones is things like mobile phones which you didn't have originally, yeah. which just makes things very difficult to do. I think, yeah, setting it in a in Cold War era, you just remove all of that and you can just get straight to the story and the characters. Yeah. So tell me about the A to Z part, because it's, it's James Bond A to Z. How does that all fit in with the podcast? Is that just a structure to, 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 to hang it on or is there something deliberate there? Well, this is one that we have to give to, to Tom Butler, 
Uh, this is basically his idea. Yeah. He, he um, we, we were kind of talking about how you do a Bond podcast and there's quite a few Bond podcasts around and they, they've got different <laughs> formats. Sometimes, sometimes people do the the films in order and do yeah. kind of a re- review of those. Um, but we wanted to go a bit more in, in depth in it. I think the idea behind it is that we all, we're all massive Bond fans, but we're also, we're not experts on Bond. So every episode is basically us learning about Bond, really. We're not just discussing what we you know, we're not watching a film and all discussing it. We're t- picking things from the ho- throughout the whole alphabet and we get given them at the start of the week and we go and research and we come back and go, it's amazing. You didn't know this about this person. So we're teaching each other as we go along. Um, and that A to Z structure just makes it great because you don't miss anything. It's not like you're just going for the things you're interested in. And sometimes um, the other Tom, he kind of pulls, pulls together these lists of people to cover. And half the time, I don't know who they are. And then we yeah. go into it and it's suddenly you actually, it turns into a, an hour long discussion about a, a product designer or something that, that you didn't even, a production designer that you didn't know about. So um, yeah, it, sh- it helps shape it quite a lot. And it, it really means that, you know, it's, it's got a lot of learning and knowledge that's going along all the way. What's and it's, your... uh, it's interesting because um, we, we do, spe- when we come to a film title, we do a special. So we, we deep dive into the whole title. And the first one we did was A View to a Kill. Because right. that's the first one that comes up alphabetically. Right. Now, if we were doing a normal Bond podcast, there's not a, a chance we would start with that. No. Oh, so we'd put that off for a year. <laughs> 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 and so it means you, you, you know, you you're doing stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think. Oh, let's we must let's do this. But when you end up doing mm-hmm. it, you you do learn things in in a different way, and it keeps it yeah. um, interesting. What's yeah. been your favourite thing that you've learned then? Oh, I think for me, it's um, one of the things that I like about the podcast and the Bond series is not so much the obvious stuff like the what happens in the films and, you know, the different Bond actors. It's I quite like the people who made it and I didn't really know a lot about the people who made it before. So I think for me, the most interesting episode that we've done is the Cubby Broccoli episode, just because, you know, directors and producers are quite important to films, but you don't often know a lot about them and their story. And you look at somebody like Cubby Broccoli, he's more important in many ways than the actors to how that whole series got made. He's fundamental to the whole series. So just going through and learning about him and his life was just phenomenally. Interesting. And I learned so much from that, which, yeah, it's amazing because I've been obsessed with Bond for so long. I think yeah, we what... could have done a whole podcast on Cubby Broccoli. Really? Like yeah. A whole just, just yeah. A character. Because he, he had another fellow with him and they fell out, didn't they, or something? There was two of them originally. Saltzman, yeah, Harry yeah. Saltzman. Saltzman. We've they... not got to him yet. Okay. No. All, right, all right. Would he be on it? H or S? I don't know. I don't know. S. S. For Saltzman, yeah. I think, yeah. I think one of the, the most wonderful things about Broccoli buying the rights to the Fleming books is he ended up with Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And the, the film was on a few weeks ago and I ended up watching it and thinking, like, only the James Bond people could make this, you know, because it's got the tricked out car. It's got the special effects. It's got the big scenery, the big sets. It's yeah, it's on a it's, Bond yeah. scale and it wouldn't work it's... really if it wasn't. So it was kind of lucky, no. even though the, the Chitty Chitty Bang made nothing like James Bond. But to make to, to do the justice to, the, to to make a great film, it was great that they had the Bond people making that. Oh, uh, yeah. And there's a lot of similarities between Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and some of the other films. You look at things like uh, You Only Live Twice and you've got those massive set pieces, you've got Little Nelly and things like that. There's a lot of similarities between Bond and, you know, this massive kids film. Well, Goldfinger's in it, isn't he? Well, the Goldfinger, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's another thing we're learning as we're going through. The crossover between people oh, working yeah. on it is, it's so, it's so vast. Uh, yeah, we normally mention Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Bang every episode. You do? Yeah. yeah. I think, Crosses I, quite a lot. I always liked, and I did a bit on the radio years ago. I I tried to claim that the song "Chitty Chitty Bang Bang" was the first successful rap song, and it caused a big <laughs> argument and a lot of phone calls, because you know it is at least proto rap, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely about... uh, in that theme. Yeah. How and, did the arguments go? And, and it, also, did... and also, Dick Van Dyke sounds like a, a rap artist. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> but anyway yeah, yeah. Did, did well does that is that what the um listeners came back with on that was that yeah was that, that was consensus? one of the things that came back yeah they actually agreed with me in the end if you try to define mm. what rap is which is this rhyming you chitty 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 bang bang yeah. we love yeah. you you know the oh, chitty, chitty, whatever it is our yeah. fine four friend of friend so yeah i don't know can i ask you about are you fans of the west wing 
I've never seen it. I've, I've never seen it, no. Okay, well, The West Wing, it, it's, a, it's an American political drama, and Martin Sheen plays a fictitious American president in the present day uh, called Jed Bartlett. And he mentions something about James Bond, and I want to run the reference past you and get your take on this. So President Jez, Jed Bartlett, played by Martin Sheen, he has an issue with the vodka martini shaken, not stirred. And he says, shaken, not stirred will get you cold water with a dash of gin and dry vermouth. The reason you stir it with a special spoon is, not, is so you don't chip the ice. James Bond is ordering a weak martini and being snooty about it. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with that. Well, is he right? I mean... Because I, well, I can't start well, to think, well, if you're going to shake it, yeah, the, all the ice is going to melt and you're going to get a weak martini. So maybe Bond yeah. is wrong and it should be stirred, not shaken. I, I mean, mean, in the Bond dialogue thought, to a but, film, it sounds great, but actually as a drink, probably not. Yeah, I've, 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 in all my years of being a Bond fan, I don't think I've ever actually had a proper vodka martini shaken, not stirred. <laughs> well, I haven't, and I to did... be honest, I, I wouldn't want one. I think I ordered well, one once tasting... in a Weatherspoons when I was younger, and I think the person <laughs> laughed in my face. Yeah. <laughs> Did but... you order it like Bond? I, I, well, it definitely wasn't like Bond. It, it wouldn't have appeared like Bond. <laughs> so did they, did they serve you it in the end? They poured some vodka and some martini in the glass and shook the glass and gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was only about £2.10 at the time, so I don't, it, it wasn't the classiest... But, um, but you've well. actually tried one, did you say, Brendan? No, I've not tried one. I don't intend to. Oh, all yeah. right. Okay, you just don't fancy it? No. Okay. You I talk... would have one. I would have one. I think they're, they're quite a specific way to make them, though, isn't there? There's a few different ingre- uh, a few different recipes to making them, but um, you've made me feel like I need to have one now. I might, might make one tonight. Uh, from, from, my memory <laughs> of, from my memory of reading Casino Royale, which is, I think, where the, it's the first book, I think there's a, he accidentally tells a bartender to put two drinks together, but he doesn't call it a vodka martini shaken, not stirred. There is a drink in that, and I wonder if then, you know, artistic license took over and it became yeah. what we it's know. It's the Vesper it martini, isn't it, Brendan? The, yeah. In Casino Royale. Casino. That's the start yeah, of it. Yeah, because the, re- the recipe's okay, actually yeah, in Casino right. Royale. I see, right, yeah. I see. That's in the yeah, movie. Yeah. That's in the, the, the Daniel Craig. And the Craig. book. Yeah. The book yeah. actually has the recipe in, doesn't it? As a, yeah. as a, I can't remember uh, now. I can't remember. But I know there's a drink in there and he, he, he just kind of throws it together and he kind of invents yeah. this drink. And that's what mm. it is. It was called a Vespa Martini. Mm. Yeah. Not a vodka martini. Yep. Okay. So yeah. I don't know how many... I, that's probably an interesting thing to look at. It's probably never actually mentioned earlier in the in the Bond series. There's lots of things like that, that a, a Bond law that never actually appear in early early films. Butler's probably um, watching this going, I know all the answers to this. Because yeah. well, in, in, in the books, he drove a Bentley. He didn't drive an Aston Martin. Uh, a battleship yeah. grey yeah. Bentley. It was nothing yeah. like a, you know, a, well, I don't think they probably had the DB5 by the, in, when the books were written anyway, most of them. No, no. We, we covered that in our Aston Martin uh, episode and talked about how, how they came to use that. And, um, yeah, again, it's, it's interesting. The use of uh, brands. Is, is something that is interesting in the books and also the films. It is, because so, I can remember in yeah. Live and Let Die, it talk, was it Live and Let Die or The Spy Who Loved Me? It was another one I read. It talks about he had a, a gunmetal Ronson cigarette lighter. And I remember that being a thing. And But but seeing that, you know, well, there's branding in there, which was unusual mm-hmm. for a book. And then, of course, they take it to extremes in the in the movies with the cars well, in, and the watches in, in, and... It's a very clever technique that um, Fleming uses because in the books he uses branding to explain the character, which is a really good way to explain a character. You can, but basically the brands are doing the work. If you yeah. um, if you say somebody drinks a certain type of booze and it's a very famous booze associated with royalty, you can yeah. straight away understand that, that that character. The problem with the movies is that the that, that's not why they pick the brands. <laughs> no. They do a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, a man who uses a Sony Ericsson phone, you wouldn't necessarily think is a super spy. No. Um, so no. It, it doesn't it doesn't quite translate to the to the film versions of the, the the products. What always made me laugh about them showing the films on TV in this country is because we have this weird 
or TV companies have a weird phobia about advertising. It's the only place I know where they've put stickers over brand names on TV and on Blue Peter yeah. it used to be sticky back plastic, not sellotape and all the rest of it. Because yeah. they had this this thing that you couldn't have these brands, yet they would show things like James Bond films which are loaded with product placement and that's oh, yeah. not a problem. Yeah. It's the same TV station showing it, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you were talking about the stories of the making of the films. Isn't there some hell of a story with Thunderball? Isn't there some? Oh, isn't that a hell Thunder, of a story? Thunderball's got whole like books dedicated to to the story of how it was made and who owned the rights. Um, in fact, I won't go into too much depth there because there is a lot to it, and I'll probably get it all wrong anyway. But um, when uh, Cubby and Harry got the rights to Bond, they they didn't get the rights to a, a couple of them, which were Casino Royale. And Thunderball, they didn't manage to get the rights to. And there's a whole legal battle around um, the characters and all this kind of stuff around um, what films they could make. So, which is what well, one is why Casino Royale wasn't made until in the last well, 20 years. Well, they years. made that David Niven and Woody Allen thing that was awful, didn't they? With Peter yeah, oh, well, that yeah. was because that was, yeah, we watched that recently. But that's the, <laughs> was that who is it? Is that Columbia, um, Brendan? Columbia, yeah. 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 They, so they had the rights to it. So they could make Casino Royale. Uh, uh, Cubby and Harry couldn't and um, Thunderball was actually owned by another guy who, who'd who helped to write the script for that um, and then they couldn't make that as well um, and then there was yeah there's a big, big story behind it but um, eventually they managed to get they worked together on Thunderball to produce it with this guy who, who owned the rights to it yeah we, Kevin McClory is his name Irish it, uh, one, wasn't it yeah yeah mm. and he crops up it's constant and he's, he's a he's character forever. though as well isn't he this... absolutely when we get to him that's going to be about four episodes because yeah, yeah. He, oh well. he was trying to make a Bond film even into the noughties so you yeah. know this is prolific yeah yeah it's, and didn't yeah, Fleming get Fleming got into trouble for ripping it off didn't he didn't Ian Fleming yeah. get into trouble for ripping off his own because apparently he nicked the Thunderball story and put it out as yeah, a Yeah, well, they worked, they, worked, they worked together on it because he was... Fleming was desperate to make Bond a, a film series, basically, from his books. He was working on this all the time. So he was working on the Thunderball script with Kevin McClory. And together, they came up with a lot of the characters and the... Um, like the I think the Spectre's from Thunderball, isn't Spectre, it? Spectre, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, so the that's where the legal disputes came in because... Who they couldn't work out who owned the rights to these characters and all this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was just amazing stories from the early days of Bond, all sorts. So there's more than there's more than just the Thunderball story about the, the kind of how they got made and everything. Is it because like Never Say Never Again from '83? That was Thunderball, wasn't it? Remade. <laughs> well, yeah, he, yeah, he, <laughs> he owned the rights to Thunderball, and he so he could remake Thunderball if he wanted to, which right. you know is a bit limiting, but. Um, Obviously, Sean came yeah. out for it as well. But that's not a bad film, actually. I don't mind that one. Never. I think there is. Brendan, someone... do you want to take that one? Um, well, I watched it recently because we've, yes. we've covered Connery recently, and uh, so I, I made made myself watch it. And do you know what? You're right. It's it's not bad. There are worse James does... Bond films. Oh yeah. There are yeah. Well, A View to a Kill is one. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it lacks that polish that Eon give it. You know, you've got the soundtrack the sets yeah it's it's just missing some of that uh that, that makes a bond film a bond film really yeah mm. yeah so what about the best james bond you i know you're gonna say pierce brosnan brendan what about you tom um i'm always i say always it changes for me quite a bit but um at the moment sean connery um you know, i think what's happening as we started doing this podcast my views on certain areas of the bond films is changing and as you watch all of the bond films what changes quite... what is it do you think it's age as well as you mature a bit oh i think when when i first watched bond films i think there's a lot of them that you watch at a certain age and they're favorites because of that and you enjoy them because i i mean i i used to love man with golden gun that used to be one of my favorite bond films but i watched that when i was quite young and now yeah. coming back to it as an adult who's actually you know analyzing these films for their quality you go, oh, actually, it's nowhere near as good as some of those other ones we watched, is it? Um, yeah. But that's that's uh, Bond is a lot like that. A lot, a lot of people's views on Bond is very much tainted by when they watched it and what it was a mm. part of. Their, so your you favorite know, when Bond, they were younger. then? Your favorite Bond? Connery, uh, no, no, Connery, no, no, and Connery. Goldfinger. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I was, I mean, I I didn't think there was anything wrong with Roger Moore in Live and Let Die. 
I think some of the later ones, including Moonraker, they were terrible. And it, and he was wrong for it, and he was too old and all the rest of it. But I think Live and Let Die was good. And I always liked Connery from seeing them on TV when they started rerunning them, you know, starting with Dr. No. But I saw, you know, Joe Rogan, who does a podcast. Yeah. I saw he was interviewed. I forget who his guest was. And, and they he asked Joe Rogan who his favorite Bond was. And he said, Daniel Craig. And the guy said, why? And he said, because he's the only one that's played Bond that actually looks like he could kill someone. <laughs> yeah. and since, I reckon, I reckon since Connery can, though. Since he said that, I have thought, yeah, maybe my favorite Bond yeah. is actually now Daniel Craig. Because he, he's right. Yeah. I don't know about it, yeah. Connery. Could he have? I don't know. He'd do it in a different I mean, But, like, Daniel Craig well, looks like he could get in there and beat him to death with his bare hands. I don't think you well, could say that about Connery. You'd need a gun. We did a Connery episode, and... Connery got up to some pretty heavy stuff in his in his younger days. I definitely wouldn't want to. Uh, you know, and that's in real life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. He had said some things about women that were a bit controversial, weren't they? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of stuff around that. And also, mm. what didn't I can't remember the story now. There was there was one about him just getting into a fight with, with a gang, I think, at one point. Yeah, yeah. he. Um, yeah, in Edinburgh. Yeah, he, he was like yeah. targeted by a gang, and he he basically roughed them up and told them to. To back off, and then he got a reputation as being the hard man. So was this yeah. after he was Bond, while he was no. famous? No, this is before before, yeah. before Bond. Oh, okay, yeah. in real right. Mm. Wow. Okay, because yeah. he was a swimmer, wasn't he? Uh, I think he did a bit of swimming. He was more of a footballer and a bodybuilder. Um, right. Later on, a bit of a tennis player, but he was he was a fit guy. He was a, he was a big bloke, six foot two, I think he was. Yeah, six foot two. So where, where are you with George Lazenby? Well, Brandon. On the Majesty Secret Service is up there as one of the best films. It is a good it's, film. It's only mm. let down by Lazenby, sadly. I just find him he's very wooden. Mm. But he hadn't acted, so I mean that's not not his fault, is it? <laughs> well neither had Connery I, I... really. Had he hadn't done that much. Yeah, Con- Connery was a budding actor. He'd done done Lazenby a few Lazenby was a model, few years. He? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Con- Connery was trained. Connery knew what he was doing. But I, I actually mm. think that I, I quite like Lazen being on Magic Secret Service. I was actually having a conversation with um, uh, Butler the other day about it, where I think when it, that's why what makes Bond so interesting, you have this switching of characters. And even if one isn't quite as good as the other one, it's quite nice to have that because it adds a relative level of, you know, if, if you see uh, Lazenby come in and you don't really like him, then you realise how good Connery is. And then when more comes in, you you've got the... You can compare it, but you can't do that often with films. Look at things like Mission Impossible. You know, it might be better with another lead lead actor, but you just wouldn't ever know. Yeah. What about Timothy Dalton then? Because he he's the one that practically put them out of business, isn't he? This this is well. This is where we need Tom Tom Butler again. Yeah. Yeah. But Butler's the uh, Timothy Dalton man. But I I think he's I think he's great. I think he's um, wrong time basically. If he if if he'd come in later. He would have been really good. He just wasn't in there at the right time, and and he wasn't used correctly. Yeah, he, like... he laid the groundwork for Daniel Craig. He definitely Craig did. He, it was a grittier Bond. It was closer yeah. to the book Bond, a, a grittier kind of a thug character, and it yeah. was almost like they played it safe with Pierce Brosnan. Have you excused that, uh, Brendan? Because he went back to some of the humour that Roger Moore yeah. had brought to it. So it was a safer bet at the box office, and he was already yeah. a big name from what was that show? Was it Remington Steel? Is that the show he yeah. was in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, he, well, he, he actually he actually got the role in 1986. He he was Bond, um, but then it all fell through because Remington Steel, you know, triggered a clause in their contract and got him back. So oh. Timothy Dalton was very much a bit of a panic uh, announcement. Right. Yeah. Where did he come from then? Because he seemed to come from nowhere. He was a big stage actor, and I think this this is what you probably. He, this is where he comes in and he was probably wasn't, wasn't right at the time because he was such a shift from Roger Moore. Roger Moore, obviously, the the, the comedian, the, the joker, the, the fun one, whereas they shifted the tone so much to a Shakespearean actor with these kind of dark storylines. Mm. The world just wasn't ready for it. And and that's why um, Brosnan kind of came back because he he sat in the middle of those. So he, he was fine. People could accept him. But yeah, Dalton, he just, he just was, the world just wasn't ready for him. Yeah. Do you have a favourite James Bond fact, each of you, that you've discovered doing the podcast? Oh. James Bond A to Z? I think mine is Casino Royale 2006 is the first time we see rain in a Bond film. 
Oh, that's top trivia. Really? It doesn't yeah. rain in any other Bond film? I need to check 2006. That. I know, it sounds it sounds preposterous, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You've got me like kind of going like, there's lots of nighttime yeah. scenes I can think of. In yeah, there's night and there's and snow. Stuff. Yeah, there's yeah. snow. Um, mm. But rain, no. Wow. No. Because he, he goes to exotic locations, doesn't he, in, in the, you know, the classic Bonds. He's... Yeah. He's not f- flitting around in, in rain. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. What about you, Tom? Do you have a, a stunning Bond fact that blows your mind? It's not as stunning as that. Um, but I think one <laughs> of the most interesting things that I found out was the um, uh, Money Penny. Yes. Um, across the whole of the series, so all like 25 films or whatever, she's only actually been on screen. And actually, this probably doesn't count the last couple of films because she's in those quite a bit. But um, earlier on, she was only in the whole of the series, like less than an hour which is amazing when you think about it, because that wasn't many days filming. But for somebody who's so important to the series, to just, yeah, just come in for a few days and do their bit. Yeah, yeah basically one of the main characters. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So best Bond film, you're saying, what, you're saying GoldenEye. You're so, what was yours? No, I'm you? saying mine's Goldfinger as well. Goldfinger oh. as well. Okay, the gold ones. And Tom, yeah. your best one? Remind? Goldfinger as well, yeah. yeah. Goldfinger as well. That's right. Yeah, you said Goldfinger. So what's the worst? Mm. Oh, Brenda Gore. It's a view to a kill. <laughs> we talk Damn, about this a quite kill. a lot, Graham. What, that's a, that's we worse do. than Octopussy. Octopussy and, and Moonraker are pretty bad. <sighs> there's th- there's they've, certain... got, they've got redeeming features, though, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, there's the, there's redeeming features to both of those films, I think. And, yeah, view to a kill. There's oh, oh, We're saying this now, but we haven't actually watched Octopussy or uh, Moonraker recently. Have you watched yeah. Moonraker recently, Brendan? Yes. So we could we, have you. We could change a tune slightly when we've got to Octopussy. But um, yeah, I think if you to a kill, there's just there's just far too much wrong with it. Um, it for so many, like there's it's not just the story's wrong. The fact he's too old. There's just so many things. If you watch that film, you sit in there, and there's whole like ten minute sections where you think, why is this here? Yeah. What's, why did they do this? Something is about that the, is that the one with Grace Jones? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is, is who is the best? Probably the best thing about it, <laughs> her and Christopher Walken. They're Christopher very good. Christopher Walken is a great villain in it. You got to give him. Yeah, that. he is yeah. a great villain in it. Yeah, originally meant to be first... David Bowie. Was it? Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah, but fact, they spend yeah. the first forty minutes talking about horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has no relevance once they leave the horses. That's it. It's done. You think and... that? See, I still can't get over. It. For me, it's Moonraker because they go into bloody space in a space shuttle. Yeah, and then that is one of the bad henchmen has him and the girl with the pigtails, the Russian thing. It's just. Oh, I think the last great um, Roger Moore James Bond was Spy Who Loved Me, which is nothing like the book, but it's actually I think quite a good film. It's Thunderball yeah. again, but except with submarines instead of um, space <laughs> capsules being captured. But still, yeah. it's Thunderball again. Yeah. But. Um, I think that is a great, actually, a good James Bond film, Spy Who Loved Me, and the submarine car. Oh yeah! Wow, you know the Lotus. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's it's a sim. It's like, it's almost like the um, Moonraker is like a continuation of Spy Who Loved Me, isn't it? And it just go too far. And they have to yes. Bring it back again they take it to, they go. We've mm. gone underwater. Let's go to space now. Yeah. yeah, it just goes way too far. Okay, who should be the next James Bond? Mm. Oh, um, go on, Brendan. Well, if I give my answer, we did a, a Q&A on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And my answer was Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. If it can't be Pierce Sorry Brosnan, about this, who are you, you going to pick, Bren, if you can't pick Pierce Brosnan as the next James Bond? Oh, it's such a difficult question, isn't it? Because everyone's vying for it and you don't know which angle they're going to go for. Um, the age is a thing as well. What age are they going to go for? Is going to have to be somebody mid 30s you know a- anybody older than that you talk about idris elba he's too old now i would i would have loved idris elba there, to, yeah. to have I would, a crack i think he'd make a great james bond but you're right he's too old now he is too old yeah yeah so it's difficult yeah. it's, it's hard yeah i can't give you an answer i don't think i mean i, I think it might head towards henry cavill but we'll see which one's he what's he been in he's superman, superman. at the moment oh okay nah no, I can't see that. That's it's, not it's what a, necessarily what I want. <laughs> it's yeah. very hard to in in um back in the early days of Bond, there were so many like, you know, T 
tip-offs and things that the, who the next bomb was going to be and you kind of you could kind of see what was happening but nowadays it's so difficult to gauge because there's so many people in the running for it and so so many options it, it completely depends on what ha- what format they go down yeah. um for the next bond films we've talked a bit about going back to like the old days like the 50s and 60s and, and doing it that way and that will completely di- dictate who does it i actually think mm-hmm. somebody like um uh, jamie bell um okay We've talked yeah. about this a few times. Yeah. Is an interesting move because he's, he's not. Done, he's y- done some hard man parts, hasn't he? He's done like what was that skinhead in America part, and he was good in that. I forget what that film was called. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's definitely getting towards this. I, I like the idea of Bond becoming a bit more real, and you see that a bit with with Craig. But Craig, he's he's kind of more real in that he's you know there's more violence and stuff, but he's also quite ridiculous in some ways as a spy he still pulls the, the cuffs well doesn't he when he's when he's jumped off the rooftop or whatever he still does <laughs> yeah that. yeah i just i just want to see a bond and i think somebody like jamie bell would, would do it well where you're not running across rooftops chasing a man who's like basically flying through the sky um because n- not any human could do that i think i'd want to see somebody who's really really like a spy and what they would do in that situation yeah um, f- Tom f- Butler actually said a couple of weeks ago, Riz Ahmed would be a good shout, and I, I'm, I agree. I, Riz Ahmed, like which one's him... he? What's he been in? Um, what's his biggest role? Would you say, Tom? Not sure, actually. I'll, sure, I'll Google. Let me probably quick... Star Wars. Which one? Who? Yeah, what was he in Star uh, Wars? Yeah. Let me just let me Google it. Riz, how do you suppose last name? Oh, there hey, he hey, is. Sh- okay, yeah, there he is. Hold on. Yeah, he, he did Shanker. loads of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. He doesn't look tough enough to me. I reckon he'd make a good baddie. But yeah. I don't know if he'd make yeah. a Bond. But they can all sort of bulk up, can't they? Because Daniel Craig, when he got the role, he didn't look like he does now. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about him bulking up, but you see Roger Moore and Piers Brosnan in a couple <laughs> of their films, and I don't think they bothered bulking up very much. Well, they did round the guts, especially Roger Moore. In the, <laughs> yeah, last the later one. ones, yeah. me. View to um, a kill. Yeah. We always keep coming back to View to a kill, don't we? We talk now, about it quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a female doctor in Doctor Who. Could there ever be a female James Bond? Ooh, this is the the big question, isn't it? Well, again, it it would depend what what, what angle there. So you're not ruling yeah. it out. You're not no. ruling it out. No, uh, absolutely not. No. Um, no, it needs to be done in the right way yeah. and um, it, to be justified. But yeah, there's no no reason why. Why not? I mean, it's a fictional character. <laughs> so yeah. they've got complete freedom to do what they want. Yeah, yeah. They, they, there's been, um, it, back in the, uh, well, it's actually early 2000s, Barbara Rockley, who's now one of the, the producers on it, um, she was looking at starting a, I don't know if you remember the um, one of the, the female lead in uh, Die Another Day, who was um, Halle Berry. She was playing a character called Jinx. Halle Berry, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so what uh, Barbara Broccoli wanted to launch a f- film about Jinx, basically have a spin-off of Bond, which was about Jinx. It was essentially a female Bond. Yeah. And I think that was a good way of doing it, where you're creating a new character. It doesn't have to be the same character, and that was the idea. So I'm not ruling that out. I think that's probably the, a good route to go to go forward, where you create these new characters, and they, they can be male or female. But I definitely don't think there's... you know, It could be a woman, but I don't think it's going to happen for, for a while. It would turn upside down all those accusations of, of sexism, particularly with the Connery Bond. Um, yeah. Yeah. The names of the female characters didn't help. Um, no, you can't. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I, yeah. Remember, I remember getting into a lot of trouble on, on TFM when I did the breakfast show up there for a few years. And we came up with this game called Spy or Spice. And we'd give the listener a name, and it was either the name of a female character in a James Bond film or the title of a porno movie. <laughs> and the listener had to tell us whether it was Spy or Spice. So, of course, we had Pussy Galore and, you know, yeah. we had uh, Miss Goodhead and all. We had, we had them all in there. I mean, they were... But we got, yeah. in, got into a lot of trouble with it. But the, I wonder why Fleming did that with those early ones, because they were just so cheesy. Just it was yeah. almost like Benny Hill had written James Bond, wasn't it? It was like a Carry On film, wasn't it? It yeah, was. Um, yeah, yeah, it didn't help. Oh, well, it, at all. And also, it got to the point where they were rubbish. <laughs> like they, they, they weren't even clever names anymore. They were just <laughs> like didn't mean anything. 
yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, that's what gets rerun. How many times have you seen that scene from Diamonds Are Forever where she goes, I'm plenty, and Connery goes, of course you are. I mean, how many yeah. times can they rerun that scene? It's not, it's not helping yeah. things at all. Yeah. No, but but no. even more, more recently, when they did it with Christmas Jones, and you just think, she's, yes. she's only called Christmas, so they can do that line do that at the end of the that one joke. Film. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which was straight out of a Roger Moore line, like like the end of <laughs> Spy Who Loved Me kind of line, you know, the keeping the British yeah. end up and re-entry and all that. Yeah, I, ca- I can't imagine Piers left the set that day thinking that was a good day. <laughs> yeah, 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 this dialogue is so good. <laughs> <laughs> Who writes this stuff? Yeah. What about the new film? What's going on with that? Well, hopefully it might get released at some point. That would be, be nice. Out of date by the time it does, it will be a period piece by the time it comes out. <laughs> yeah. You'll get your wish. Yeah, well, they've yeah. already had to go back and um, change the, the phones in, in the movie Have because they? they're out of date. Yeah. So already they're out of date and they've had to go back and rejig yeah. it and change things. Yeah. Oh. So that's, well, that's a difficult to... thing when it comes to branding because all these, all these brands are involved and they've got their products in. And if the products are out of date, it's massive deals that are suddenly affected. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was meant to be released in 2019, and here we are, halfway through 2021, and there's no still, date, is there? still got to wait. But it's the... end of September now, end of September, hopefully. I, oh, oh, I see. I'd, I'd heard, I've, I'm obviously you'll know more than me, I'd heard they were going to release the trailer in October, but maybe not then. They are. It's a bit earlier than that. Yeah, it was. It the film was coming out in October, and then they've moved it, uh, moved it again yeah. to the. Oh, they've moved it end again. Of September. Yeah, so they've, they've got a lot of talk early. about the premiere now. It's meant to be the most expensive premiere ever, I think. Um, so, yeah, this, it's going to be a big deal. Because yeah. yeah. it's basically the return of cinema, you know, after this long mm. lockdown, isn't it? This is signaling. Yeah. So that's actually quite back. clever. If you're going to reopen the cinemas, you want a, a marquee event to do that. And that could be the yeah. way to do it. So it actually might yeah. work in their favor, especially as yeah. it, will it be? Will it be Daniel Craig's last one as well? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, it, it's meant to be. We did yeah. say that last time. Yeah. 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 He said that twice, so we'll see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you think he actually meant it, or was that a negotiating tactic? It's hard it's to difficult. tell. I think... Go on. I think, I think there's... Um... It's it's difficult with the the uh, all of these series, and this happens quite a lot, and it happens with Sean as well, where they want to leave, but then... A, something drags them back and it's not necessarily money it might be there's actually a good script that's better than the ones they've done done before and i think with with um with craig it definitely seemed like from what we read that it it was just it's just a good script and he suddenly thought i want to do that um so yeah uh it seemed to drive him to do it do you have all the the negative comments at the end of filming you think they've it's been grueling you know it's a the filming yeah. schedules are really sort of strict and long. So you're working on it months and months on end, you know, and then as soon as you wrap and you do, you've done all the uh, promotion for it and somebody asks you, will you play Bond again? I mean, you're going to, you're going to give them a negative answer, aren't you? Like, yeah. You've basically just been on the road for the last six months. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, you know, you can understand where he's coming from when he says, oh, I don't want to do it anymore uh, yeah. after each film, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Do you think there will be another film after this one? Because that would be a good time to start. Um, I... <sighs> another Craig one. Just, just or... another James Bond film. Whether this because they oh. they ran out of the Fleming books what twenty years ago. Oh uh, well, they, yeah. they just. I think they probably need to um, just re rejig it again and just come up with a new concept. One of the problems that we've got with the the, the current series of Bond is that it's a it's one big story. So Daniel Craig's from the first film to the end of it, it's a big story arc about him, yeah. his character as Bond. Yeah. So you basically got to start it again, and how they start it again yeah. is gonna is gonna have implications for you know the success. And I think that's why we're talking about it going back to maybe maybe being set in the fifties and sixties because yeah. it it will shake it up a bit and it'll make it a bit more interesting. I, other than that, I don't know quite know how they'd continue it in the in the current way. Yeah, I mean, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if it was the last Bond. I'd be very, oh, very yes. surprised. Yeah, yeah. It's I still making a lot of money. Yeah. 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 There's that there's that showbiz thing about it's not how you start, it's how you finish, and you want to go out on top and leave them wanting more. But then there's the money involved. And even a crappy <laughs> one is guaranteed to make somebody some money yeah. along the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you've got the and the, the way the world is going at the moment, most films and things are suddenly being turned into series on 
various streaming channels. So there's always there's a lot of questions around that. Is that going to happen as well for the Bond series? Will it become? Yeah. Are that they going to be, that break could be it a up? place to do the period one? Is to do a, yeah. a TV mm. mini series, but it's like Cold War Bond. Yeah, yeah, that would be a place to do that, and then you could still do your blockbusters with a. You could even use a different actor and everything in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you but can, that's you the can thing, break out the did, actors but, as well. Yeah, yeah. If they did go yeah. down the Bond universe way, yeah. there's huge scope for it. That's where you'd get your female lead, you know, and they create a new character within the Bond world. And yeah, it's, I think there's definitely room for it. I mean, look what Disney are doing with Marvel. It's yeah. vast. You know, yeah. they're just expanding all yeah. the time and i think there's, there's room for that with bond that doesn't i'm just worried be... about the, the amount of podcasts we'd have to do that's right yeah now oh, you, yeah. Guys, <laughs> you guys are actually exploiting the bond franchise like illegally probably because you've got absolutely nothing to do with cubby broccoli and eon films and everything you're just doing your own thing and no one can stop you um yeah. there doesn't seem to have been more recently the the, the spin-off like i had a little a dinky or corgi aston martin and a friend of mine had the uh the awful moon buggy whatever it was from diamonds are forever when i was a kid and we don't seem to have had the toys so much do we recently definitely not a big part of it anymore i think and it's probably because as you look at the roger moore ones they were designed for their family films really there were there was lots yeah. of things happening for kids and there was like there was it that some of them had like actual they basically had toys built within them whereas nowadays they're much more adults adult orientated so i can't imagine a very good kids play set for a daniel craig film It'd be pretty <laughs> pretty dull yeah unless it was like a uh how to beat up a baddie or something a self-defense video or something i don't know um yeah yeah <laughs> I, 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 re I really don't know it's fascinating stuff it's good to talk to you the podcast is called James Bond A to Z, it's available through all the channels? Pretty much everything, yeah. yeah. And are yeah. you making any money at it yet? Are you really exploiting the Bond franchise? No, we're not. No. We're not. I mean, what we basically just wanted something to, a way to share our obsession um, yeah. and kill some time during during lockdown. And it's just turned into a bigger project. But um, no, I mean, we really just, it's, for us, it's just more about showing off our pointless knowledge. Yeah, and it's about opinions as well, isn't it? Because everyone's got an opinion on Bond because there's been so so many of them and, you know, favourites, worst, best Bond, you know, a lot of the things we've covered on the on, on the uh, on the chat today. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, we yeah. do have a lot of discussions and, and lively debates amongst ourselves on the on the podcast, so always a treat to hear one of those. It's normally me and Brendan arguing about Is it what you, what's, <laughs> what's the uh, what lights the blue touch paper? What kind of I mean if I if I start talking about Pierce Brosnan then that's it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Normally I turn off at that point. <laughs> well, I hope nobody's turned this off. It's been great to talk to you. It's James Bond A to Z. Tom Butler's usually on it, but he's uh, he's not on this one. But Tom Wheatley and Brendan Duffy were were better than having him anyway. I'm glad we didn't have him because I heard he was rubbish. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're glad to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm only kidding, Tom. I don't know. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Just My because... phone's just flashing now. Yeah, because I'm just hoping this gets back to him and it gets more publicity for <laughs> podcast radio and the Pod 20. Yeah, so anyway, hey, thanks for talking to you guys. Thanks a lot. Best of luck with it all. We'll see where you end up on the podcast chart. In three weeks' time, you'll be my guests. Uh, and it's every Friday, five o'clock, it's on DAB in London, Manchester, Glasgow, Birmingham, and it's online everywhere else. And it's a podcast itself. It is the Pod Twenty, and we will be showcase we will be showcasing James Bond A to Z with Tom Butler, and my guests Tom Wheatley and Brendan Duffy. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.